Hello, everyone, and good morning. This is Tim Rischolte, the CEO of the Professional Development Academy. It is great to, uh, to be with you this morning for this Executive Insights on Leadership webinar. Uh, as you can see from our title slide here, Summer Craze Fowler, the CIO of Argo AI, will be joining us today, is joining us today. And we're extremely excited about this presentation. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, if you look to the left of Summer here on the screen, you can see that we've had a number of, of, of great executives providing their insights on leadership throughout this year, starting with Malcolm Harkins in, in uh, January and, you know, uh, uh, Susie Smybert as early as last month and now Summer uh, for this month. And it's just been a really great year of, uh, of insights from these executives who are running uh, major industries and shaping industries and leading significant teams just working on just an amazing uh, set of projects and programs and products and services that we all benefit from uh, every day. And, you know, today is no different. We're, uh, we're also in the Thanksgiving mode here in the United States where just around the corner we have Thanksgiving and it, it, we're extremely grateful and very thankful that, uh, Summer, you are joining us today. And I know a number of individuals that are dialing in who have been uh, in our Professional Development Academy, uh, as well as their supervising managers, as well as others, are extremely interested in just the technology behind the work that you do. And I'm going to ask you to, to lead off with that in just a minute uh, to, to help us understand a little bit more about Argo AI, because uh, many folks may not know about Argo AI, but they certainly know about the autonomous uh, driving industry, the smart car industry, the smart and connected cities that many uh, cities around the United States and around the world are Let me try. Hold on just a second. Let me hold on. I'm going to try this uh, instead. I'm just going to go to the <laughs> laptop and see if that is any better. Uh, so uh, I was trying to dial in by phone to just make sure that I had a good solid uh, connection via the landline, but uh, the technology outwitted me. And so uh, again, welcome <laughs> everyone. Um, uh, you can see that we are affiliated with a number of institutions, the Cyber Risk Alliance and their portfolio of companies. If anyone is interested in planning to attend InfoSec World in 2020 uh, or interested in SC Media and the materials that they have, uh, feel free to let us know. We are connected. We can get you some substantial discounts uh, to uh, those uh, services that those organizations provide, being an affiliate uh, for those, uh, those, those institutions. Let me quickly uh, introduce Summer Craze Fowler. She is the CIO, of, as I've already mentioned, at Argo AI. It's a software company that is focused on uh, establishing uh, significant advancements in the self-driving technology uh, arena uh, for massive organizations that are driving that technology and really leading the effort in bringing about safer communities because of safer vehicles on the road and helping pedestrians as well as drivers uh, alike in, uh, in, in, in managing that technology. Summer is responsible for that. And, uh, and Summer, I'm going to ask you to describe a little bit about Argo AI in just a second. But before, uh, before Argo AI, Summer, uh, it, you know, uh, was at, as you can see there, Carnegie Mellon University, responsible for their CERT program and division. Uh, she was a technical director there, responsible for cyber security risk and resilience. And you can read some of the other aspects here on your own as I ask Summer to provide a little bit of background on Argo AI. Summer, it's always great to be with you uh, in any capacity webinar so that we can learn a little bit more about your perspectives on leadership and your insights on leadership and managing this advanced technology. 
as well as other work that we find ourselves involved in. I'm always grateful uh, when I am uh, working on things together with you. Today is no different. I are extremely grateful that you're here and lending your insights on leadership. Uh, and so Summer, with that, welcome uh, to the program. Uh, we'd love to learn a little bit about Argo AI and then dive into your presentation after which I'll facilitate some Q&A. So if folks are, uh, have some questions or are interested in uh, collaborating and communicating with Summer, feel free to use the chat box and uh, I'll be managing that along with Alicia and working with Summer throughout the next hour. So Summer, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. This is really fantastic to be here. Uh, I, I really love being a part of the PDA leadership uh, program in and of itself. And uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit today about Argo, it's Argo, as Tim mentioned, and then also just some of the things that I've learned in terms of leadership over the years, specifically targeted towards how I've handled uh, some of the, the technical teams that I, that I work with. However, uh, this really applies broadly across all of leadership. So I believe I have control of the slides now. And I'll tell you a little bit about Argo and about self-driving cars, because that's often uh, the question that I get asked when, when people say, oh, you work for one of those self-driving car companies. I'm so scared of self-driving cars, but I'm intrigued. And that really excites me because uh, it's sort of the feeling I have as well. I'm not scared of the cars, but I realize that we just have this, this awesome person, this awesome responsibility when it comes to uh, getting this into the field and making it available for, for society at large. So I will be talking about self-driven leadership, a little bit of, of a pun there. I want to start with, as Tim mentioned, my background. Um, and I use this quite often when I speak. This is what's called a visual resume. So it's taking everything that I've done uh, since I graduated from school um, and moving forward and put it into one slide or a PDF and it tries to represent me in a, a visual manner. I can't take credit for uh, the concept of this. I saw it on LinkedIn maybe six or seven years ago now, and I was intrigued, and I decided I want to try to build one of those. It took several, several hours, maybe 10, 12 hours to really build this out uh, in Visio, and then I did one in PowerPoint because not everyone I knew would have access to Visio. Uh, but really, it just talks through, you know, lots of things that interest me, lots of things that I've done in terms of accomplishments with my teams. And then also, what are those key words that I want uh, people to remember about me? If you're ever interested in building one of these, I'm happy to share my template uh, so that you don't have to spend the 12 hours to build it and you can make this your own. Uh, but you can see the timeline going through. I came out of the University of Pittsburgh uh, with my master's uh, in 2000. I did my undergrad there as well. I worked as a software engineer for, for several years at Northrop Grumman in Baltimore. I ended up meeting my husband at Northrop Grumman and uh, when we got engaged, I decided I would leave and try something new so that we could diversify our you know, personal portfolio. I did a little bit of consulting at Booz Allen Hamilton in the field of cybersecurity with the, the uh, NSA. And I decided that I really didn't love just consulting. I wanted to get a little more hands-on again I was working with a group at Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab, and I went there as a, um, as a technical project manager, still working with the NSA. Um, at that point, personal decisions to move back to Pittsburgh to be close to family uh, because we had started our own family, and that's when I started at Carnegie Mellon University. And you can see I spent um, 11 years at, at CMU. I loved it there, and uh, at that point, I was really heavily moved, had transitioned from software into cyber. Uh, and uh, that, that was an actually fabulous opportunity to work across the government, across academia, and across a lot of private industry, helping to develop tools that those organizations could use to measure their cyber risk, to close gaps. And several years ago, I, I decided that it was time to, to take another leap and try something new. And I wanted to apply the cyber skills uh, but I, I also really wanted to stay, stay in the tech space. And the autonomous vehicle, or AZ as I will call it, that industry is something that is really hot here in Pittsburgh, um, just as it is around the world, but we have a, a concentration of several companies that are focused in this space. So I started looking at those companies. 
And I'll be honest, at that point in time, there were very few companies that were even thinking about the word cyber. They were just thinking, we have to write a lot of software and it has to work. And so it took a couple of years to really get to the point where there were AV companies that said, it's time for us to really bring cyber into the mix. And this happens quite frequently, as you know. It, you know, they, you don't want to bring it in, uh, you know, too early, which in my mind can never be too early, but you also can't wait too late. And so about a year and a half ago, that's when I really started seeing, you know, job opportunities, talking to the right people. And last fall, the fall of 2018, I spoke to the leadership at Argo AI uh, for the second time. They were looking for uh, someone to lead this space, and I really was just a great cultural fit there, uh, an extremely forward-leaning, transparent leadership team. And they brought me on as the chief security officer. Uh, over this past summer, I became the CIO because I also took over the IT team. So I have two branches with IT and the cyber team. The cyber team is also split between um, the enterprise functionality of the corporation and then the product itself. So um, I have a team that's focused on our actual cars and on the systems that we build, and then a, a team that's focused on Argo as an enterprise corporately. You can see lots of other things. I do a lot of speaking. I love to speak um, at, at conferences. It really energizes me to hear from folks. So I see people want the template. I will make sure that that is made available. Uh, you can even email me directly. You'll see my email at the end and I can get it to you or I can make sure that it's available through Tim and the PDA team. Uh, but you know, it, the InfoSec world, I'm on that board of advisors with Malcolm, very excited about that event. Uh, and I, I really do get energy from folks asking their questions um, and helping me to learn as well. So please do post your questions as we go through uh, this, this morning uh, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, I guess. So Argo's mission is to make transportation safer. And there's almost a period in our mission there, uh, but it's then more accessible, affordable, and convenient for all. We have an extreme focus on safety, uh, knowing that uh, we want to put human beings in these cars and knowing that we will have human beings and other living creatures around these vehicles uh, that is our number one priority. So everything that we do focuses on the, the safety angle uh, of, of autonomous driving. Cybersecurity is then a critical element of that, of course, in terms of the interconnectedness of these vehicles. So we will have cars that are talking to infrastructure, we'll have cars that are talking to the cloud, and we'll have cars that are talking to other vehicles, and potentially even someday direct to pedestrians. I mean, we, we can imagine this how, how more connected the world will get over time. So let me take a couple of minutes and talk just a little bit about the technology before uh, I jump into some of the leadership angle of things. Um, people often ask, what really is an autonomous vehicle? And the, the Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE, has defined five levels of autonomy. Uh, and you can see here, level one is assisted, meaning that you, you have to have a driver. Everything is really done by that driver. Up to level five, which right now is called full automation. And I'll be honest, we don't really have a complete definition of what it means for a car to be fully automated. And, and what does that mean? Because, hey, I'm in the self-driving business. Aren't you building a fully autonomous car? Uh, the answer right now is actually no. We're building what we're, our goal is level four autonomy. So what that means is we have to have a defined environment that we're operating in. So we geofence or map an area of, of the world and cities right now, and that's where our cars drive. So while they are, are uh, perceiving and detecting the things that are going on around them, they are driving in a mapped region, in a region that, that that car knows, that it understands you know, where there are curbs, where there aren't. And we are mapping every day, hourly, by the minute, by the second, to see what those changes are and get those changes back out to the fleet. There are also some situations that we understand um, an autonomous vehicle at this point in time, uh, even with all of the advances we've made in artificial intelligence, there may be a case where uh, a human operator needs to take over remotely. And I'll, I'll talk about that because that sounds really scary. So let's say you're in an autonomous vehicle and there's a water main break uh, you know, on State Street 
in, in the downtown area. And a nice citizen, human citizen, decides to get out there, the first person on the scene, and flag vehicles around that water main break. Well, my autonomous vehicle will actually recognize that there's a water main break, can see the water, and can actually sense how deep the water is. Uh, there's a lot of technology behind that. However, at this point in time, that autonomous vehicle is not going to know how to handle a, uh, a civilian flagging the car to go somewhere. It really just can't interact with a human in that manner. In that case, the vehicle will recognize that something is, is awry and will contact back to an operations center. The person in the operations center will then have access to be able to see everything that the car is seeing that human operator can send commands to the AV system. Now, that person is not driving the car, and there's a very particular reason they are not driving the car, like with a steering wheel or a joystick, and that's because we don't want that, that, uh, that person to be a bad actor and do something that the car shouldn't do. They will be feeding commands that then the entire safety system of that AV will, will be able to take in and say, does it make sense for me to make a sharp left here? Uh, or do I know that that would take me into a lake? Or do I know that that would take me off of a bridge and it would stop the car from taking that action? So it's um, you know, putting all of these systems together uh, so that we do have that safety, but also understanding that level four autonomy is really what we're going for by the end of 2021. A level five, it will come someday. We have to define it first. Uh, but that's, that's pretty far out there. And I've heard also some criticisms of, wow, so this has to be in a mapped area, a geofenced area. I can tell you we have um, thousands and thousands of miles already mapped in the cities that we're operating in. And just to give you a little background on that, we do operate here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have um, an office in Palo Alto, California, where we also have cars driving. We have an office and a, a garage in Dearborn, uh, Michigan, uh, which is next to our prime investor of Ford. We work very closely. Right now, we're only on Ford vehicles. Uh, we also have an office building a LIDAR, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, in Princeton, New Jersey, near Princeton. Uh, we don't have a garage or driving there. That is wholly focused on building uh, the LIDAR technology. We have a very large garage operation in uh, Miami. Uh, which is a, a crazy driving environment. If you live there or have ever visited there, it's why we're there, because it's really challenging. And we also drive in Washington, D.C., and we are opening a garage in Austin, Texas next month. Uh, so, you know, we're really trying to get a bunch of different environments. We're really um, working in a lot of different climates. Uh, that's another thing with L4. We have to think about climate and how the car handles weather. Uh, and, and so it's a challenge all around. But I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a definition in terms of what we're really going for and when. So level four by the end of 2021. So when we think about a, a, an autonomous vehicle, and you can see a picture of one there, uh, and, and it's pretty cute. We actually call this area at the top where the sensors are on top of the vehicle, the tiara. Uh, so it's this little crown of the car. But when I look at, at how we think about artificial intelligence, so it's taking human intelligence and putting it into a machine, uh, this is really the corollary. So we have algorithms in the car to detect things, to perceive things running very quickly, um, thousands slash millions of simulations to determine what to do next. And this is how our brain works. Uh, we have sensors, lots of sensors on the car, including the LIDAR that I mentioned and will tell you about. We have radars, we have cameras, we have LIDAR, we have listening devices. Um, we have different types of cameras and lenses. So fisheye, long range, short range, uh, near field, far field, uh, all kinds of different ways to perceive the world around the vehicle. And then the wiring in the car is like our nervous system connecting everything. And then it, we have what's called actuation. So uh, our software will send commands to the car and those commands are intended to actuate the vehicle or make it move or stop. And then the vehicle platform. So the platform, as you can see here right now, we are uh, working entirely with Ford for the moment. Um, in 2017, um, our founders received one billion with a B dollars from Ford uh, towards the, the AV problem set. 
And this past summer, we signed a deal with Volkswagen for almost $3 billion. Uh, part of that, we're acquiring a company uh, in Munich. Uh, we are currently in our antitrust activities with, uh, with the government, with the U.S., German, Chinese, and Brazilian governments. And we hope to, uh, we signed the deal in July, and we hope to close on the deal early in 2020. Uh, so then we will be on the, the Volkswagen platform as well. So the main components of the AZ, as I mentioned, we have perception and predict prediction. So this is the car actually being in the environment, taking in what is around it, so perceiving the environment. And we don't just do that through one type of camera or one type of sensor. We do it through multiple uh, types of cameras and sensors and LIDAR, which is a, like a light-based radar. Um, and then we also look at traffic signals, we look at people, we look at bikes and animals, all kinds of different things that are around us. And then we run a prediction on that or, uh, you know, the algorithms to say, what is going to happen next? Where, where are we in terms of um, a bike that's going down the road? What is the prediction? Is it going to turn left? Is it going to turn right? Is it going to go straight? Is it going to stop? And so you can imagine there are just so many factors that, that go into that. The maps and localization is what's part of geofencing the car. Uh, so we're building these um, incredibly detailed and accurate maps of the environment that we drive in. And we're also looking at things like how do typical actors, uh, people, um, act in those areas? Is jaywalking common? Is jaywalking uncommon? Um, and those help feed our algorithms. Now, does that mean that if we are in an area where jaywalking is, uh, is not common, that we wouldn't account for it? Absolutely not. It just means that it would go into some of those algorithms as we, as we are operating. Um, and then we have uh, motion planning and controls. Um, and I, I apologize. I'm going to walk over as I talk to you to open the door for my crazy dog. Uh, so we have motion planning and controls. So we have uh, decision making and evaluation based on all the things that we talked about before. So the perception, the prediction, the math, that all goes into some of that motion planning. How fast can we go? Um, what type of braking should we be doing at this case? Uh, are we on a certain type of hill? Are we going into a tunnel? Uh, so, you know, th there's big three main components that all fit together like this. So you can see over here on the left, we have the various sensors, that LIDAR or, or light detection, radars, different types of cameras, and then all kinds of other inputs with GPS and speed. I think it is important to note that these cars are not operating solely on GPS. That's a very common misconception. That's why we have maps and localization. Um, if GPS wasn't available or you're in a place where you don't have a connection, we are using GPS as part of our input, but it's not what the car is based on alone. And then the compute, and this is where those three parts come together, where we're perceiving, we're predicting, and we're doing route uh, motion planning and control and, and all of that using that map and localization. All of this together then feeds that actuation. So how does the car move? Does it go forward? Does it stop? Does it turn? All of those, those things. So the benefits of AV, very quickly I'll go through this. Safety, of course. I mean, safety is always top of mind for us. Um, you can see some of the statistics here that I won't go into, um, but, you know, what we really want to do is save human lives through, through all of the work that we're, we're doing with these AVs. It's really great because uh, our cars don't get angry. Our cars don't get distracted by, by children in them. They don't get distracted uh, by, by texting or by turning a radio channel. Uh, and then we don't have to worry about things like blind spots. We have 360 degree situational awareness of what's going on around us. Uh, we also have uh, ways to predict things that are maybe obfuscated. So if I have a really big truck that's parked on the side of the road, what are some of the things that I can do to detect what's happening behind it or predict what's happening behind it? We also, in addition to just safety, are looking at uh, better city and then ultimately beyond city dynamics. So what could we do if we didn't have to have so much parking space? 
taken taken up by you know cars that are sitting um, not moving. And it's incredible when you think about uh, the cars that you actually um, the cars that you have and how frequently they are in use for their intended purpose. And then we want to think about congestion and traffic, which then also leads to benefits for the environment. And then thinking about accessibility. Uh, lots of different things when it comes to people who have disabilities and can't easily get around uh, when people are elderly and they have to leave their homes because they don't have options to get to doctor's appointments or get to grocery stores and how autonomous driving uh, will be able to help with that. And then on the right there, you see upward social mobility and, and studies into the fact that commuting time or not having access to transportation is one of the strongest factors in um, being able to escape poverty. Uh, there are also parts of cities um, like Pittsburgh that have food deserts. So for example, um, living in a region where there are no grocery stores. And so the people there don't have access to healthy food. And how we can change lives if we can either take those people in an inexpensive manner to get to grocery stores or perhaps even bring food into those neighborhoods so that now you have a banana or an apple or a vegetable that may cost the same or less even than a Milky Way and how that can change the lives of the children uh, living in those regions. So if you have any questions about autonomous vehicles, uh, definitely put them in the chat. Definitely reach out to me after this if you want to talk about that. Uh, but I don't want to bore you to death with the technical details. Uh, I know we, this is a leadership seminar. So uh, autonomy is really, really hard. However, I would say that sometimes leading the people who are building this is even harder. Uh, uh, it, it's really hard to lead this, this group of uh, hyper-intelligent people. And innovation sometimes can seem really organic, and it seems really cool that maybe we're you know, sitting around having these cool ideas that come in and we're able to translate that into, onto a whiteboard, and then we can translate that into a simulation or, or a piece of software. But innovation requires a lot of care and feeding, and, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, with how we lead these teams. And it's Monday. So I want to have some fun with this. The next several slides that we'll talk through um, are a talk that I gave, part of a talk, I've actually adjusted it, at a CIO forum where I was asked to talk about exactly this. How do I lead technical groups? What is it that I do um, you know, to make sure that I am providing my people the right things so that they can innovate and meet these challenges of level four autonomy by the end of 2021? So if you are all familiar with uh, with the concept of, uh, of the CIA triad in cybersecurity. That's saying that we're looking at confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we want to make sure that our data is, is free from access from people who aren't authorized to see it. We want to make sure that the data is what it's supposed to be, which is the integrity. Nobody's changed it who isn't authorized to change it, and that the data is available when we need it. Uh, Thinking about that, I was thinking in terms of, well, what are my, some of my CIO tips? And so I took the letters CIO, TIP, and I actually came up with six things that, uh, that I use and keep in my mind on a daily basis and how I try to act in leading these teams. So this is Summer's six-sided shape of CIO tips, and hopefully um, you laughed more than my children did when I told them about this, who just rolled their eyes. So first thing is consistency. Uh, when you look at the brands here at the top and you see Disney and Subaru and Ikea, um, you know, if we were sitting in a room together, I would ask you, what are the words that come to mind when you hear these three company names? And often with Disney, we get customer service or we get entertainment. And with Subaru, I hear performance. And with Ikea, I hear uh, value. Uh, sometimes I hear uh, people laughing about, you know, complexity of putting together furniture um, and having keywords about trying to do that with, with a partner. But there are, there are certain things that, that jump out when you hear these brands and other brands. And, and for the most part, this is, these are the things that we come to expect from those brands. We expect that customer experience. So this consistency of brands. 
Well, it's not only the investors inside of these companies who really want predictability and consistency. Um, your team wants this too. If you read a lot on leadership or you read about studies, consistency is one of the most desired traits in any sort of leader. Um, I often joke that that means that if you're an asshole, that means you should be an asshole 100% of the time. Uh, not really, I don't want that in any leader of mine, but that consistency is important. Um, your team doesn't want to walk in on a Monday morning and have you being, uh, you know, super pleasant and very calm and easy to work with and to think if they give you bad news that you will be a team player and then if they and help them solve it and then if they come in on Tuesday that you're going to fly off the handle and, you know, throw whiteboard markers across the room and clear your desk. They want consistency of, of behavior. And this isn't just about performance of the team and how you're going to perform. It is about your style. It is about your management technique. It's about your attitude. And, and when we think about this, your attitude and approach are your brand, just like Disney has that, that concept of customer service. So thinking through what is your brand and how are you making sure that you are consistent in emanating that brand. The second thing there in, my, in the CIO tips um, is identify. So uh, when, when I looked at this, it was find, find your passion, and your passion might be in the mission of what the company does, uh, and I love, uh, you know, I feel that in, in my work every day, or it might just be in what you provide for that mission. Um, and so that's not to say that in everything that your company does, you have to completely buy in and you have to think, wow, this is my life's work and my life's mission. But you want to find your passion for how you support something inside of that organization. So what drives you? Uh, and then thinking not only about what drives you, but identifying what drives your team as well. And then thinking about what the company needs. So now you have things that drive you, things that drive your team, and what the company needs, and it's your job to put all of those pieces together and put together the plan for how your, you, what drives you, what drives your team, and the company needs are brought together, and so that you're building that, that puzzle and that picture all together. And when you think about it as, as a leader, this is really ultimately um, what your responsibility is, right? So you have your brand that you're being consistent with, but then it's also about identifying how you're going to achieve those things that are most necessary for your company and for your people and making those line up. Ownership is, is my O in here. Um, and I have a little bit of a story, as you can see, there's the, the rowing team uh, on that picture. So I was on the rowing team at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I only actually did it for two years. Once I got into uh, computer science deeply, I ended up having to give up those 4 a.m. wake up calls uh, mainly because I wasn't going to sleep until two or three uh, programming. Uh, but I was on the team and I was a rower for a brief amount of time. And then they asked me if I would be uh, the coxswain. So the coxswain is the person who sits either in the front or the back of the boat um, and, and yells and tells the rowers what to do. So it's the perfect job for me. Uh, my, my kids will tell you that. But what, what you're really doing as the coxswain is you're, you're steering the boat with very gentle movements, um, of the rudder and, all, and, and what that is is it's adjusting for inconsistency in the rowers themselves and how hard they pull, how they all put their oars in the water at the same time, et cetera. And then you're, you're working with the people in the boat, uh, either eight-person boats or four-person boats or what I had, and you would be helping them to make their adjustments. And I was recommended at the time some books by Brad Lewis, one of them being a wanted rowing coach. So Brad Lewis was an Olympic rower. And he then, um, after the Olympics uh, and winning uh, in Lake Placid, he went on to coach at, um, the, at UCSD. And there he talked about the fact that uh, being a coach, he had to learn very quickly that when someone on the team was making a mistake, you would say, uh, listen up two seats, uh, you, you know, your catch is a little slow. Can you adjust your catch to be a little faster? So the catch is your oar going into the water. And he said, if you are praising someone for doing something really good, you use his or her name. Now, everyone in the boat knows who's in two seat. Everybody knows that's Liz, you know, or Mike in the two seat. However, there's a psychology behind using the seat number rather than the name for any type of criticism. And translating that into other things at work, 
uh, you want to own your team's action and own your team's mistakes. And if you're going to call out any sort of mistake, uh, you want to make sure that it's not a person's name. In fact, you're trying to do that in private altogether. Um, and make sure that the praise then goes out uh, publicly by name. Um, and, and also part of this is you're at the top and you have to provide this cover and you are literally paid to make decisions. That's how you got into this role. And so decisiveness and ownership, uh, decisiveness definitely being another one of those key terms that you see uh, in any sort of what do you want in a leader poll, you know, right there with, with consistency. Uh, so making those decisions is very important. And then what the, the results of those are, of those decisions are, and how you handle that is important. If it's, if it's a team mistake, you, you do own that. If it's a team success, the team owns, owns that success. So trust, so moving on to, to number four uh, in, in these six tips, uh, trust, building trust with your team. And uh, I had an opportunity over the weekend, I was out um, in Palm Springs for uh, Ernst & Young, EY has their Entrepreneur of the Year event. And my CEO had been nominated, it was a really exciting event. We talked a lot about uh, how as leaders we can, we can find time and get to good points of delegation. Lots of times, type A's like all of us, or many of us, have trouble with that delegation. And, and how do we get there? It's by building this trust. And trust is really uh, two-way. Uh, I, if I take it back to the slide before, you can see there, no one is going to be in my boat if they think that I'm going to steer them into a bridge, right? So they have to trust me, and, and I have to, to trust them. And, you know, there are two different types of trust. There's the practical trust and then there's the emotional trust. And really, we want to get to the point where we have both of those, where we can, we can work with people and understand on two levels, that there is both the practical trust and the emotional trust. And I'm a hockey mom, as you could have seen on that, that first slide in, in the lower right when it talks about my interests. So I have a nine-year-old son who plays hockey, and we spend a lot of time watching hockey games and decomposing different things that people in the NHL do. So what, what we've, we've seen that very successful teams do is they build trust for blind passes. So blind pass is when I might use my backhand or, or do a pass behind my back or between my legs to someone that I can't even see, but I know that they're there, and I know that they're there to pick up that puck and, and receive it from me. Uh, so things that you can do uh, to build some of this blind trust is have transparency with your team. Share your weekly accomplishments. Share your weekly uh, things that you didn't achieve, right? So where you didn't make an accomplishment and you have to push that to the next week. You need to practice active listening. So that's making sure that you are really hearing and interpreting what it is that the people on your team are saying to you. Um, asking questions, but you're not listening to ask. You're listening to absorb and then be able to think about what the question is. Uh, being inclusive. Uh, so this is something that if you're not inclusive across your teams, um, you may have a limited amount of trust built, but you're not going to have team trust. And, and, and this, you know, goes across thinking about um, not just that diversity angle of, you know, do I have representation on my teams? Am, am I doing this? But actually giving people the opportunity to talk um, and giving people the opportunity to, to provide their feedback to you and, and showing that you are inclusive and actively listening to everyone. And then of course, it's about being in position. It's about you being in position um, and making sure that when, if a path comes to you, that you're there as well. So that doesn't mean that it, it, it's an open door policy, right? You know, we hear about that and in, in debate back and forth. It's not just about, about, you know, where you are, but it's about being where your team needs you to be and you asking them and being able to say to them, what is it that you're looking for? What are some things that I can do to assist? Um, and be there, make sure that you're there uh, in anticipating where they are going to need you. So that's, that's my, my hockey analogy uh, for trust. Um, and then we have this, uh, this uh, interpretation here. Uh, and, and I thought a lot about this one uh, in terms of what is it that my team is looking for to get better? And I actually sat down and had a long discussion with, with the team that I took over, the IT team, 
uh, over the summer. And I said, what is it that you're looking for that will help you uh, to, to do your job better? And this is really the alignment part of my job in that putting the pieces together. Uh, the team said to me, quite frankly, I want to know more about the strategy of the company and what's happening. We're on the IT team. All we hear is when things are wrong. All we hear are help desk tickets. All we do are get calls when the network has a problem or when a piece of equipment has a problem. But if we could actually see the big picture, maybe that would help us to align what we're doing. So it makes complete sense. Now I use that. Um, so the first thing I did was I reviewed the, the entire corporate strategy um, our next six months and said, these are the goals. And we do quarterly objectives and key results, which many of you may do. So we, we really walked through our own objectives and key results as an IT team and said, how does this align to the bigger strategy of what the company wants to accomplish over the next six months? And we reprioritized our efforts. And then I started thinking about this in terms of everyday activities and, and what is needed to be done. And I, I started making this very tangible. So what in the world does a supply closet have to do with an autonomous vehicle, an organization of a supply closet. What, what I did with the team was use this as an example of why is it that I am asking them to make every single supply closet across the entire company in every office exactly the same. So I want to make sure that uh, pens and paper and uh, you know, the wireless keyboards and networking cables are in the exact same spot in every single cabinet, no matter where you go. And I talked about the efficiency of this, where we have very good metrics inside of our company that say, if I have a driver um, who should be out with the autonomous vehicle, um, and I could have gone into that, we have two drivers in every car. We actually have someone behind the wheel and someone who's in the passenger seat who is uh, looking at a laptop and seeing everything that the car sees and annotating if there's a mistake. Uh, but we have these, these two drivers. Uh, for every minute that they are not driving during normal hours, it's a significant amount of money lost for the company. And so I, I said to the team, if I have someone who goes to a supply closet because they need to pick up um, a new mouse, and, and they go in Pittsburgh and they, they go to grab the mouse and they know because they're in Pittsburgh that it's the third shelf up on the right in the supply cabinet. But now they're visiting, we, we do travel between offices frequently. They go to Palo Alto and now they spend minutes searching for where the mouse is in that supply closet. I'm taking time away. Now it's not that I think humans are robots and that we should be you know, blindly reaching for things, but I wanted to make it very tangible that if we have metrics on the downtime for drivers and cars, that applies to our engineers, that applies to the people on our business side as well. So easing things for them. And that's why, IT team, I want you to have things that are consistent across the organization so that we're not stealing brain power, we're not making them have to search for things, and they know what to expect around the organization. So this element was about interpreting everyday potentially very mundane things back to our mission and back to why it's important to not have an engineer spending four minutes searching for something, um, but allowing her or him to get back to that job so that we can get to self-driving vehicles at level four at the end of 2021. Um, and so there are different ways that you can do this with your teams and taking those very small things that you're asking them to do, tying it directly to the mission. And last but not least, and then we can also get to some Q&A, uh, this one is about being a provider. And, uh, and this one I, I changed since, since my last talk because this is something that I found really important after we had a leadership summit where um, our C-suite got together for two days and worked on several things. And our CEO said to us, listen, in your roles, everyone is watching every single move you make. That's my attention. You're under surveillance. If you are a leader in your team, uh, in your company, outside of your company, in various things that you do, everyone is watching what you do. They watch what you say. They watch what you don't say. They watch what you do, what you don't do. You know, we talked about the fact that when you are in the bathroom and someone is in there with you, they're watching how long you wash your hands. They're watching, do you use the hand dryers or do you use 
uh, the paper towels and how many of them do you use. Uh, watching what you post online. And they're really even watching how do you walk in the door each day. If I walk in the door with a frown on my face, it might be because I just remembered, oh, geez, uh, I, there's something that I forgot that I, I was supposed to do and I just remembered it. But if I'm doing that, somebody sees that and thinks, oh, boy, Summer's in a bad mood today. And uh, I know that Josh has a meeting with her at 11. Uh, I'm going to let Josh know she might be in a bad mood. So, you know, I don't want you to think that or be fearful of this concept, but you're under surveillance. You are being watched as, as a leader. And what does that mean in terms of being a provider or what I have on here? Um, if you know who that picture is, that's Isaac Newton. Um, what are the, the things about leadership as a science that show we need to be providers of energy and positivity inside of our company when we are there? Um, and, and I looked at this and said, okay, there are synonyms for provide, which are feed, give, hand, supply, and then, sorry, this rendered incorrectly. There are also antonyms. So you can hold or you can keep back. What I'm really looking for in terms of, of what I want to provide in leadership is I want to be the provider of good energy, of positivity, of, of a force that is not taking away from the mission or not taking away from what the team needs to accomplish, but that's actually supporting it. So the, the last slide I have on here about my, my tip still has to do with provide. And I thought about this um, as I was helping my fifth grader with her science homework, and she was working with paper airplanes and looking at the laws of motion. So the first law of motion is that every object in a state of uniform motion will remain in that state until an external force acts on it. I want you as a leader to be that force. Uh, I don't want you to, to, uh, walk, to, to walk in and see a team that's, that's standing still and just continue to let them stand still or struggle. Be the force that pushes them into positive action. If, you don't, if you're not that force, that team is just going to stay there because of, of the law, the, the, the laws of physics here. Looking at number two, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, I know you're all hating me. You're thinking, wow, you said we wanted to have fun on a Monday morning, and here we are with physics. But if I look at this, that's saying if my force is zero, then acceleration is also going to be zero. Uh, your team knows this. If you don't help to push them and put them in a positive way, they will know that they can just stay at an acceleration of zero. But also as important in this law, if you exert the same exact force on two different objects, so in, in the physics world, it's objects of, with different mass, different, different sizes, you get different reactions. And so you have to know how much force to apply and to whom you need to apply it. In other words, the way you push one person on the team might need to be very different than the way you help, and I don't want to say push in a bad way, the way you provide to energy to one person on a team is different than the way you may need to provide energy to someone else on the team. And it's that recognition of that law of physics that it's just going to be different if you always apply the very same force or the very same, provide the same energy. It's also this last one here is, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You need to find balance on your team. So in this case, we're talking about, you know, exertion of force. If I'm sitting on a chair, gravity is forcing me down, and then the chair is actually has a counter reaction to hold me up, right, pulling me away from the ground. Um, if, and when you push an object, just like when you, you shoot a gun or a cannon, there's that, that uh, back coil. That is the physics. There's the, the, the force going forward and then the recoil coming back. If you don't push hard enough or provide enough, neither of you is going to go very far. I mean, so a, it, an easy tap, you might push, come back a little bit, and the, whatever you're tapping might go forward a little bit. That's not, that's not good. However, it's also remembering if you provide or push too hard, you're going to have a long separation. It's going to be a deep separation, and that's not what we want either. You want to think about that balance like you have um, of, of sitting on a chair or finding that equilibrium. So I don't want this to be overly sciencey or boring, but when you think about it, uh, what do I do uh, each day to remind myself of this? As I'm driving to work, I think about being that provider of energy, being that provider of what I want the team to accomplish that day, 
and how I'm going to approach that. In some cases, it's going to be more force than others that I need to provide. Um, and, and then I also have to think about my attitude in that because I'm under surveillance. If I walk in with a really horrible attitude, uh, that type of force is not going to be something that is going to keep us together. It may separate the team because of that, that, opposite, that opposite push. Uh, but I really want to be that provider of good energy and to be able to discern as a leader uh, how to exert my own force so that I get the reaction that I'm looking for out of my team. Those are, are my tips, as, as you can see here with my, my six-sided shape. Uh, I hope that, that you get something out of it, if it's even one little tidbit that you want to practice or take with you. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, so Tim, I am happy to take questions. Um, have you asked questions? Take it from folks in the chat. Um, however you want to handle this next, but thank you guys so much for, for spending a, a little bit of time on this Monday um, and, and indulging me as I gave you the tips that I have. Yeah, thanks so much, Summer. It's, it's always great to hear your perspectives, not just on the, the deep technology that you're moving forward with and, and really uh, creating new industry and new capabilities, with Argo AI and, and that we will all benefit from in, in the, the very near future. But it's also always great to get your perspectives on the leadership behind that and what's what's needed, you know, from the small things and making sure the supply closet is kept in the same way so that we speed uh, efficiency and effectiveness in the way in which we go about our work and with one another uh, in, in more important things. Uh, because as we've always heard, you know, if you can't be great at the little things, it's really hard to be great at the big things. And so it's a great uh, explanation of that. We did get a couple of private uh, chats from individuals. You know, it was great to learn about physics on a Monday. That was fun summer. Uh, so that, <laughs> I'm reading it positively. Uh, you know, you could read that was fun summer very sarcastically, but I think it was meant to be very positive. And then someone else did type in saying they love the, 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 the summer uh, uh, CIO tip uh, uh, documentation that you've got here on screen that we end with. And so it was very, very helpful. Um, I did also get a couple questions and we do have some time for some questions. I did get a couple questions. Uh, one of them is very technical. Well, I shouldn't say very technical. One is more technical than leadership focused. Uh, the other one is leadership focused, but let me start with the technical one. And it says here, uh, I'm going to paraphrase some of this summer, but it says here that, uh, you know, the work that you're doing is, is very cutting edge, it seems like. I work in an IT industry where we benchmark and go through peer reviews with competitors. And I'm curious if Argo AI does the same thing or if the technology is too new and you hold things very, very close to the vest. Do you engage in a lot of benchmarking where you're sharing intellectual property because of the benefit that we'll have for safety within our communities? Or is Argo AI and your competitors much more uh, secretive and, and closed off uh, uh, at this stage of the game? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is truly that it's a little bit of both. Uh, so in the, I like to say in the early years, the, the company's only been around since the very beginning of 2017, the, the very end of 2016, really, uh, where we had about 10 employees. But in the very beginning, it was, it was much more close hold even than it is today. Now, that being said, our intellectual property and the things that we're developing, we hold very close to the vest, right? I mean, that's your competitive advantage. That's what we have going for us. That being said, um, we, we don't believe we can solve this on our own. So this past June, we released something called Argoverse, and that is a publicly available site where researchers or other companies, anyone can access a lot of our data, and they can use that data for their own research, and they can use that data for the things that they want to achieve. Um, very specifically, we hope that it stays in the AV space, However, we also realize that a lot of this data can be used to solve other challenges as well. And so we do see a little bit more sharing when it comes to um, data that we procure and data that we produce out of our AVs so that we can help solve some of the other, uh, the other problems that are available. And we also have been working very closely with Carnegie Mellon University uh, where we funded a $15 million program with the university to solve specific problems in this space. That's all publicly available because as a nonprofit university, 
they have to be able to publish on what they're doing and make things available to the public for other universities and other companies to use as well. And then very specifically in the areas of uh, public safety and public policy, um, that's really where you see companies come together because we know that in regulation, if any of you are in, any of you are in highly regulated um, industries or sectors, you know that you want the industry to help determine some of those laws and regulations and not leave this up to the government, which doesn't have great expertise in all areas. So we are working with other car companies, other AV companies, other infrastructure companies to help come up with some of those policy recommendations and, law, and laws and other uh, types of regulatory activities that we know for sure are going to be handed down to us. Um, so it's a little bit of both. Uh, we do share a limited amount of data. We know that we can't solve this alone. Um, at the same time, as the head of cybersecurity at the company, I sure as heck am, am working uh, very hard to make sure that those things that we want to stay private uh, do stay private. That's, That's a great, great question. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for the explanation. Thanks for the transparency in that as well. Um, you know, a question just came in, and Todd, thanks for uh, the post of the question here. How do self-driving cars account for criminal behavior when driving? Yo, th so this is something that is, is really fascinating because we have this struggle between wanting to be so open and have convenience in our lives, and then also um, privacy and, and making sure that, you know, I don't want to feel like when I get into my car that it's any sort of government that's watching those things that I'm doing. But there are many things that we have to account for. I mean, uh, not just criminal activity in terms of if someone gets in our car is, and is on an FBI watch list, uh, is that something that we should be compelled to turn over? Um, if someone is in the car um, on a drug deal or someone drops drugs into the car to let someone else pick up that car next. Um, I was even thinking of a case where what if I have two parents who are in a bitter, bitter divorce and they think that it's okay to put a two-month-old child into an AZ because they, want, they don't want to see each other and mom or dad thinks, I'm just going to put the baby in the car and have it driven to the other parent. Um, that way I don't have to see him or her. Um, you know, crazy scenarios that we can come up with. We do a lot of threat modeling in this space, and we do a lot of thinking about how are we going to handle any of these situations. It all comes back to, number one, the safety of the people that are in and around the vehicle. Um, so, you know, we would want to be able to alert authorities if a baby is in a car by him or herself and have that car pull over to a safe place, keep the child safe, and allow authorities to show up. But how is that handled differently than an adult who wants to have privacy? Uh, and so, you know, these are challenges that um, actually when it comes to uh, social ambiguities and legal and privacy and ethics, it is as challenging as making the car actually handle the technology itself. Uh, and so we have teams of people that are working this in addition to just the people who are working fingers on keyboard to code the artificial intelligence. Yeah, one last question here, Summer, as we wrap up, and that is, you know, in addition to the, the CIO tips here that you've provided, uh, can you share maybe a, an, an experience of maybe a, a mentor or a coach that you had growing up that, you know, you would refer to as some best advice that you've ever received when it comes to leadership, something that you might carry with you still today and, and, and take to the kids that are on the hockey rink or take into Argo AI team meetings? Is there any, like, one piece of, of advice in addition to the CIO tips that you just still carry with you and you maybe have had for, with you for a long time that you read about, was, was given as, from a mentor or others that uh, you find just very important being in life and leadership and the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, so there are, are two things that I would say. One of them is very recent, and so I'll start with that one. And that even comes just out of working at Argo, and that's always um, do what is right at the right time. And, and that do what is right is, is really the most in, important thing. So in thinking about how um, I work towards the technology, doing what's right, and how I work towards the people. And it's so basic and so easy, and we often lose sight of it. And I will tell you, um, the technology industry in Silicon Valley in general, um, Silicon Valley I'm using not as the region, but the, the industry overall, um, there's often been a lack 
of doing what is right. And so a differentiator in why I came to Argo is that entire approach, you know, d doing what is right. Um, the other question that I get very frequently um, that has to do with this, uh, especially from um, other young people or women in the field is, um, you know, you seem to enjoy public speaking. You seem to be good at it. How did you get there? What is it that you did to feel comfortable doing that? A lot of people, they say that one of the biggest fears um, in the world is, is public speaking. And that came a, a while ago when I was going to do um, some congressional testimony. And I was, I was nervous, you know, for um, one of the first times in a long time, because I do get energy. I like to take, you know, audience energy and feed my energy back. So I enjoy speaking. But I was nervous about being sworn in and, and going through all of this. Um, and someone pulled me aside who was very near and dear to me. And, and he said, I want you to get in that room and remember, you are here because you are the expert in this space. And if you don't feel like the expert in the space, then you shouldn't be doing it and, and build yourself into that. Use your team and use the people around you to build yourself into that expert and to build them into experts. But remember, you're there for that reason because you know more than those people. Share that knowledge with them. And so when I think about, um, I think about public speaking, and that, that is a question all the time of, you know, how, how do you like doing this? I, I really do view that, that as a, hey, take what it is that I, I have and hopefully share at least one thing. Um, I'm here for a reason, and I'm hopefully getting something out of you, and you're getting something out of me. So those are two things that, that I've always taken with me. Well, that's great advice and, and great insights to, to end this webinar with. And, you know, I am very much looking forward to being with you uh, at the InfoSec World uh, 2020. Yeah. You and I are going to be putting together a day-long workshop. And so uh, anyone yeah. listening that uh, is interested in InfoSec World, again, contact us because we can get you some discounts uh, to, to access InfoSec World as well as other relationships that we have with our affiliate uh, organizations. Summer, it's so great to uh, to to learn from you today here on a Monday that you've made very fun, even with physics and all kinds of other things. And, uh, you know, appreciate your, your executive insights on leadership. Really appreciate the focus that you have with Argo AI. You're, you're, you certainly are doing the right things at the right time when we need it the most in terms of managing technology for the betterment of, of humankind. And, and especially for the reasons that you mentioned, for those that are in need and for those that need access to what sometimes others here, most of us probably on the call that would take for granted. It. And so, uh, Summer, thank you so much. Next month, thank you everyone for joining us as well. Next month, we've got Ken Spangler, the CIO and Executive Vice President of Technology at FedEx. Uh, Ken is also going to be a great uh, uh, provider of insights here on leadership for us to wrap up the year uh, as we wrap up 2019 and then start to focus on 2020. And again, with that, I just want to thank everyone. I want to wish everyone a, thank, a great and happy Thanksgiving summer. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving next week. Have a, a great holiday season as we wrap up 2019. Thank you again, Summer, for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Take care. Thank you.